So I'm here today to talk about one of many of the booths, uh, but specifically about Junius Brutus Booth Jr. So he is the eldest son of the booths who, uh, who lived here. And I forgot what the place is. So uh, I have my speech written down, so I'm going to do a little bit of reading, and hopefully the pictures will entertain you enough while I do that. I just do better that way. Uh, so let me make sure what button I have to hit. Not that one. Okay, so it's not that one. Okay, so there we go. So, Junius Brutus Booth Jr. was the eldest son of tragedian Junius Brutus Booth Sr. and Mary Ann Holmes. The elder Booth and Mary Ann met when Booth was performing at the Winter Garden Theater uh, in London. Booth was so enamored with Mary Ann that he wrote her almost 100 love letters and presented her with books of poetry. After a few months of courtship, Booth convinced Mary Ann to leave her home and parents and run away with him. The couple departed England in January of 1821 with their eyes set for America. As Booth left his acting career in England behind, he also was leaving behind his legitimate wife and child, Richard. The elder Booth would continue to send money to his legal wife and son for many years until the truth of his abandonment and uh, treachery was finally made known. But early in the trip to, um, to the Americas, the ship that Booth and Marianne were sailing on made a stop at the Portuguese island of Moderna, which is located kind of off the coast of Morocco in the Atlantic Ocean. And that was a common place for people who were taking a ship across the ocean to stop there for supplies and then continue on the way. Uh, Madeira was a common landing point, and Booth and Marianne found it just beautiful. It's an island, and they just were so enamored by the way it looks, they actually got off the ship they were on and stayed there for several weeks, kind of as a, as a honeymoon even though they were not married. Uh, so they spent several weeks there, and it is on the island of Madeira that Junius Brief Booth Jr. was conceived. Uh, realizing that they probably don't want to raise a child here on this island in the middle of the Atlantic, they decided they probably should book passage and make their way to America as they had planned. And so it is on uh, May 17th of 1821 that the couple uh, departed Madeira and came to the United States. It took them 44 days, how long the ocean trip would take to get there. Uh, I feel bad for Marianne, who was pregnant that entire time. And they landed in Norfolk, Virginia. So that is where they land. That is when the Booths officially make it to America. The elder Booth would start his stage career acting uh, in Richmond, in Petersburg, New York City, Baltimore, Norfolk, and Charleston, South Carolina. And Marianne, meanwhile, is going along with him. Every, all, all the places he's traveling to, she's just following him until she got to the certain point where she couldn't travel any longer, and so she stays in Charleston, South Carolina, while the elder Booth goes to his next engagement in New Orleans. And it is in New Orleans that Booth learns that Marianne had given birth on December 22nd to their first child, Junius Brutus Booth Jr. In his book, Junius Sr. wrote, uh, received news of Marianne's delivery by a letter from a jet in Charleston. So after Booth returned to Charleston in February, uh, the child was given the name Junius Brutus Booth Jr. in honor of his father. June, as he would be called by his family, uh, was the first of the Booth children to be born in America, and the only one to be born outside of Maryland, um, the only one outside of Maryland. So he's the only one who was born in South Carolina. All the other Booths, the ones up here, uh, were all born uh, in Maryland. On August 19, 1822, the elder Booth uh, made his first down payment on 150 acres of land here in Harford County. And so he decided he wanted to find a place where they could have a home, and this was the area that he picked. Booth purchased a log house from a neighboring property, and he moved it uh, to where we are today. So this same picture is right there, but this is the original Booth family cabin. Probably this was taken in 1865 when the Booth family are no longer living here. But this is the home that all of the Booths, except for Junius Sr. and the youngest one, Joseph, he would be born in Baltimore. But everyone in between were all born in this log cabin that no one understands. So this uh, was their home before Tudor Hall was made. Uh, we don't have a lot of details about the life of Junius Brutus Booth Jr. during his early life, uh, mainly because the main chronicler of the Booth family was his younger sister, Asia. And Asia was not born until June was already 13 years old. And so we do know that June played an important role uh, in the birth of his younger brother, Edwin Booth. Uh, when Marianne went into labor with Edwin, the elder Junius was out of town. 
And so 12-year-old June was sent to go get the daughter. Uh, the night of Edwin's, Edwin's birth was, uh, it coincided with the annual Leonid meteor shower. Um, so it happens every year in November, this meteor shower. But in 1833, the year of Edwin's birth, it was the most remarkable meteor shower of those uh, in history. It is estimated over 240,000 meteors fell during the course of that night. And so June recalls vividly riding through this spectacle of stars on his way to go and get uh, a doctor to help his mother. And so Edwin Booth, who became, of course, the world famous actor later on, really came into the world in the most spectacular way possible. Yeah. And June would remember this. And in fact, years later, there would be some confusion on the part of Marianne, who could not recall the exact date of Edwin's birth. And it was Junius who would say, oh, I remember when you were born. Uh, your mom was a little busy, but I remember. And so he would always help with that. Um, so June helped with that. We know that young June was also fond of hunting, which is interesting because it was something that his father definitely disagreed with. And so in an 1833 letter, Junius Sr. actually writes to Marianne here at home saying, tell Junius not to go possum hunting or setting rabbit traps, but to let the poor devils live. Cruelty is the offspring of idleness and mind and beastly ignorance, and in children it should be repressed and not encouraged, as is too often the case by unthinking beings who surround them. So June may have had a little disagreement with his father about uh, hunting. Uh, between his duties as the eldest son on the farm, June was also given an education by local teachers here in Bel Air and in Baltimore. He studied Latin and Greek with a teacher, and the elder Booth wrote that June is a good boy, and he will make a good scholar of no mean capacity. Junius hoped that his namesake would become an intellectual. However, the elder Booth's regular drinking and occasional madness while out on tour required the elder Booth to have a chaperone source. Marianne originally fulfilled this role until she was too busy dealing with the family's the growing family and the farm. And so originally, June, as the eldest son, was given the task of being his father's keeper. June acted as a dresser and a call boy for Junior Senior, and slowly but surely picked up on the lines and the plays that his father was acting. And so in time, June would be the first of the Booth children to follow his father's footsteps and become an actor. So Junius Booth Jr. made his debut on stage on October 22nd, 1838, when he was 16 years old. In a Pittsburgh theater, June played the small role of Trestle, the attendant from Shakespeare's Richard III. From that moment on, June found a calling and would pave the way for his siblings to follow. When Edwin Booth would come of age himself, he too, this is Edwin Booth and Junius Booth uh, Sr., Edwin would take over the role as his father's keeper, and he too would make his de debut on stage in the role of Trestle to his father's Richard III. And, in, and so it was kind of a, something they passed along. Uh, young June began learning the craft of being an actor, signing on as a stock actor in Baltimore, where he had very small roles, but he slowly worked his way up. And occasionally, he received a boost when his father would come to town and would have a benefit in his honor. Marianne was very supportive of June's progress as an actor, and she believed that June was the handsomest of all her children because he so closely resembled his father. Marianne was particularly impressed with June's portrayal of the role of Adrian de Maprat in the play Richelieu. So when Marianne gave birth to her tenth and final son, Joseph, in February of 1840, she actually gave Joseph the middle name of Adrian in honor of the role that her oldest son performed so well. It was while he was working as a stock actor in Baltimore that June met Clementina DeBar, who was an actress and a dancer. It was a little escape back then that she was a dancer. Uh, the relationship between the two eventually became romantic, despite Debar and Junius uh, being several years different in age. Uh, despite this, on August 3rd, 1840, a 18-year-old June and a 32-year-old Clementina, yeah, you thought it was going to be the other way around, didn't you? Yeah. Is that? No, 32-year-old Clementina got married. Uh, the marriage may have produced a daughter named Blanche, but the paternity of this daughter is somewhat debatable. 
not quite sure if it actually is June's, or if maybe that's the reason why Clementina wanted to get married so desperately, because she wanted a father uh, for her child. June and Clementina acted a bit in New York until June signed on as a company actor in Boston, so a little bit to step up in, in his paper. The family of three would live there for several years, with June slowly performing larger and larger roles. The arrival of his father to the city always benefited him. As you can see here, that Junius Brutus Booth for one night is there as a benefit for his son, Junius Brutus Booth Jr. So this would boost him, and he would get to play the larger roles alongside his father. Uh, and when June was not in the larger roles, he was taking larger roles, he still wasn't considered a star actor yet. He had promise, but wasn't a star. Um, however, it was just about this time that June made the, well, here's another one, um, where Junius Bruce Booth is there playing Othello, and Junior is able to play as Iago. So it was very good for uh, Junius when this occurred. Um, however, as I said, during his time in Boston, he made the acquaintance of someone who would make a deep impact on his life. And her name was Harriet Mace. And this is an article kind of describing a benefit for Miss Mace and her talents. So Harriet Mace was a young actor, an actress, and she was only about 13 when she and June first performed together in Boston, uh, where they were both stock actors. Over time, the pair would be placed together often, and June would request her services when planning his own benefits. So here we have, he's probably put this advertisement in himself, as was common for actors today, to be like, here, I'm performing and I get a share of the proceeds today, so please, all my friends, come and see me at the theater so I can make a little bit more money. And so this is a benefit for June that he's having, but he does have uh, one of the actresses who's going to help him out is Harriet Mace. And then, like his father before him, uh, June fell in love with a woman who was not his wife. Clementina did not take kindly to her husband having an affair with Harriet Mace, and in 1851, had them both arrested. So this is the account of them being arrested for being all too familiar. Uh, shortly after this arrest, June took a page out of his father's book and ran away with Harriet. The pair traveled to California, where Harriet took the name of Mrs. Booth, and even though they were never legally married. So he ran away from his problems and his wife and his child went off to California with Harry. In California, uh, June found great success, his greatest success so far. While in the eastern states, June was considered an average actor, uh, in the entertainment thirsty new state of California, he was at the top of the list because he had experience. Um, so he was held in a higher esteem in California. And it also gave Junius his first chance of something that would be very prominent in his later life, where he became a, um, a theater manager. So uh, he found that he was very astute in being able to manage theaters and leasing theaters for other people. Uh, so this is what he did for several years in California. And though he was leery of returning east to face Clementina's wrath, June decided that there was great fortune to be made in California if he could really bring in some dynamite talent. And so in 1852, uh, June and Harriet returned to the East Coast kind of in secret in order to attempt to convince his father to come back with them. Because if they have Junior Senior there to perform, then there's money to be made. And here's Junior Senior. You can start seeing, especially in the pictures I've been showing, how much Junius Junior looked like his older father. And as Junius will get older, he will look a lot more like his father. But this is the elder group. And so we don't know what words Junius Sr. had for his youngest son, or for his son, for running off and leaving his wife and child behind, but he probably didn't have too much to say himself. And actually, the elder Booth had only finally divorced his first wife one year earlier, and had married Marianne and made her a legitimate woman. Um, even though the elder Booth was reluctant to make the journey all the way to California, the promise of fortune that June made was enough to convince him to do it. He agreed to a Californian tour and brought along his valet and apprentice, Edward. The four booths were joined by a friend of Junius's and they started the journey to California, which was a long ordeal and required them to go through Panama. At that point, it wasn't the Panama Canal, so you took a ship down to Panama. You, there was no train yet that existed, and so you actually had to kind of backpack or ride a donkey 
through Panama, get to the other side and take another ship to get there. So it was quite an ordeal, and everyone was very lucky when they survived it. And there's a lot of dramatic stories about people stealing the supplies from the booths and that they all, when they would sleep at night, they would put Harriet in a hammock above them and the men would sleep in a circle around her in order to protect her from, from any dangers, any barbarians who might uh, cause problems. Uh, unfortunately for June, when they all get to California, uh, the tour of, the Cal of California does not prove to be as lucrative as he was hoping for. And his father, showing no favoritism to his own child, still required June to pay him the agreed upon proceeds he was promised. And so after June paid all the expenses from the theaters he had leased and everyone else, he barely broke. Uh, so it was a very disappointing tour uh, for pretty much all the boots. Uh, Junius started making, Senior decided to start make, uh, making plans to go back to the East Coast. Um, and rather than take Edwin back with him, the elder Booth told Edwin to stay with Junius, Junius Jr. in California and try to make a name for himself and start on his own and see what he could do uh, in this gold-rich state that hadn't really worked out very well for him. And so uh, Junius Booth Sr. headed back east alone. The elder group survived the dangers of Panama, once again, crossing back. However, uh, he, he took then an engagement in New Orleans. But then when he was on a steamboat between New Orleans, making his way towards Cincinnati, he caught sick and died on November 30th, 1852. And so neither June nor Edwin returned east for their father's funeral, mainly because Marianne believed that they should stay out there uh, continue working and hopefully making some more money that was definitely needed now that the patriarch of the family was gone. Uh, Edwin would later set sail from California. He would uh, go to Hawaii and Australia where he would act um, and he would begin to really make a name for himself. But June, however, was happy to stay in California, which was his home. In 1854, June and Harriet welcomed a daughter into the world. Hey, buddy, can you hit the, ne the next arrow for me? Oh, I told him he'd be in charge of the camera. Okay. Where, where is it? Uh, the, yeah, that one. Let's see that one. It's not, it didn't is work. It frozen? It's, uh, oh, wait. Did I hit it? Nope. That. Ooh. Huh? It's going. Cool. <laughs> Alright, try again, buddy. Pardon the technical difficulties. Oh, yep, I can't even get out of it. Okay! Froze. See, your computer seems to be frozen. Because I can't even escape out of that. What did you do? <laughs> well, then now you have to well, just have to go out of my voice and I'll uh, keep working on that. Well, they gave birth to a daughter, and uh, there's a picture of her, you have to trust me. Uh, and her name was uh, Marion Rosalie Edwina Booth. That was the name. So. Uh, Junius gives her now the first name Marion is close to his mother's name Mary, but the two middle names are after two of his siblings. So Rosalie Booth was uh, the second of the Booth children, and then uh, Edwin, of course, became Edwina, <laughs> and so that is uh, the name that she was given uh, to honor uh, his sister and brother. Life in California was good uh, for June, and he had steady income working not only as an actor but also uh, as a theater manager. And so this is, I'm going to pass this around, this is a playbill um, from, this is from 1860s, so it's a little bit after what I'm doing here. But he, he doesn't, he's in this, but he doesn't have a big name recognition on this one. He is down here where it says Mr. J.B. Booth. Um, so this is from 1860 in California, McGuire's Hopper House. And one of the other names on here is that, oh, there she is, there's Marion, Rosalie and Edwina Booth. Um, she would follow in his footsteps and become an actress herself. Um, uh, so this has Ed, uh, Junius Bruce group on here, and then it also has a lady by the name of Miss A. Land, who will eventually become the future Mrs. Junius Brutus Booth, but we haven't gotten her. Um, oh, you jumped ahead now. Well, spoiler alert, Harriet Mays dies <laughs> in California. I have no clue what I'm doing here. Yeah. This is clicking this thing and it just... Dude, I can, I can do it. Know. Um, but before she dies... Oh, let me go back. Okay, when well, we stay here. All right, now it's working. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll do, I'll do it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so. Well, you fixed it. It's frozen. You're frozen. 
Um, so they're living in California before Harriet dies with Marion, and um, suddenly, uh, with no uh, warning, in 1855, June, Harriet, and baby Marion show up here at Tudor Hall. Uh, they have not sent word that they're coming. They just show up and greet their mother and, the, and their siblings. Uh, they drop in on the family unannounced. Um, June tried to play it off as homesickness, that he just missed home so much he wanted to come. But uh, Marianne was not tricked very well. And so in the end, June admitted the truth that Clementina was suing him for divorce, finally, and that he had come back to take care of the matter in order to keep it out of the California papers. Because everyone out there knew Harriet to be Mrs. Booth, and so he didn't want it spreading over them. So June reached a settlement with Clementina, and the divorce was finalized. And this 1855 visit was actually June's first to the farm since Tudor Hall had been built, uh, because it had not been completed until 1852, so he had not seen this home. He had only been used to the, the cabin that uh, he had spent a lot of time in. Um, but once his business was concluded, June and his family returned to their life in California. Tragedy would strike, as aforementioned, when Harriet Booth died on August 28, 1859, when she was only 24. Uh, June was now left to raise his young daughter alone. And he did this for a little over four years. So the playbill that's come around 1860, he is all on his own um, raising Mary. But eventually, he decided he needs more help raising his daughter and decides to move back east uh, and be with the family once more. And so in April of 1864, June finishes up his final acting engagement in California, and he and Marion return east. By this time, Edwin had become a star actor, as had his younger, his other younger brother, we haven't mentioned yet, John Holt's move. Um, when Edwin had returned home and came here, he saw that his mother and siblings were in dire straits financially. And so Edwin, now kind of rich and his star rising even higher, uh, moved them all out of here. And so they will leave Tudor Hall after Edwin's return. And he had moved the family to New York. He was kind of taking care of them until John Wilkes went on his own. But some of them are still kind of under Edwin's control. And Edwin, like June, was a single father because his own wife, Mary Devlin, had died in 1863 and left him with his daughter, Edwina. So they liked using that name. Um, their, uh, their sister, Asia, right there. Uh, was now married and had children of her own, and so she kind of helps to take care of Marion and Edwina. She's helping to raise her, um, her nieces. Uh, June spent the theatrical season of 1864 to 1865 touring the eastern states to make money. The name was powerful. The Booth name was powerful because of their father before them, and now there were the three acting Booths that really made it a dynasty. Um, okay, on November 25th, 1864, June took part in a benefit. You may have seen a copy of this playbill on the other side of that wall. Um, it was a unique one-time performance on the other side, sorry, not those. Um, it was a one-time performance at the Winter Garden Theater in order to raise money to build a statue to William Shakespeare in uh, New York's Central Park. And it was the very first time that all three acting Booth brothers Junius, Edwin, and John Wilkes performed together. And so it occurred on the, like I said, the 25th of November, 1864, and they did Julius Caesar. So this is the only, one of two pictures known of the three booths. Um, this is actually taken after the performance, kind of as a way of remembering it. And so you have uh, Junius Brutus Booth here. He is uh, the oldest of the siblings. Uh, Edwin Booth is in the middle, and this is also the only picture we have of John Wilkes without his traditional mustache. So uh, that's the only images that we have is when he shaved it for this performance. Um, after the, during this time when Junius returned from California in 1864, it really was the first time he had seen John Wilkes since their very early days, because he had been gone through most of John Wilkes' teenage years. And so he was surprised and happy to see how well his younger brother had prospered. And they started kind of spending more time together during um, 1864. Um, June provided John Wilkes Booth uh, something that was sorely missing in the Booth household, and that was a sympathetic ear. Unlike most of the rest of the Booth family who had very strong union sympathies, June's time in California, which was kind of 
you know, removed from the real fighting of the war and uh, the sympathies there were a little bit more Confederate or they were their own little, California was its own thing, it still is today, but uh, they didn't really, there weren't a lot of strong union supporters in California. And so June, over the years of the Civil War, it slowly developed more Confederate uh, sympathies, similar to Jim not to the same degree as John Wilkes Booth, but still was a little bit more Confederate in his leanings. And in fact, when June was in California, he actually put on a play which was a farce that made fun of Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of State William Seward, two people who would be targeted by his brother uh, in 1865. And so when June returned, these two men really developed a stronger bond as brothers and almost as, as father and son, just because of the age difference between them. And so uh, June became much better acquainted with his younger brother, and his younger brother told him secrets that he may not have told other members of the family. Ju uh, Junius was aware that John Wilkes was secretly engaged um, to a lady named Lucy Hale, and she was the daughter of an abolitionist senator named John Parker Hale. Uh, and of course that senator loathed the idea of his daughter marrying an actor, um, but despite this, the two of them actually vowed to marry within a year uh, in 1865. Um, and so during the short period of time when June was back in John Wilkes Booth's life, he was a positive influence, but it wasn't enough to kind of change the course of history. Uh, John Wilkes Booth threw away his relationship with June and the rest of the family on April 14, 1865, when he assassinated Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater. June, at that time, was performing in Cincinnati and was horrified by the news of what his brother had done. Uh, June barely escaped mob justice in Cincinnati and made his way to his sister Asia's house in Philadelphia. It was there that he was arrested and taken to Washington. Uh, during the fall of 1864, when John Wilkes Booth was planning his original plot, which was actually to kidnap, not to assassinate Abraham Lincoln, he had used speculation about oil, that he was in the oil business, as a cover. Now, he had been in the oil business in the summer of 1864, but had lost a whole bunch of money. He had not made anything. But as he was continuing this plan about abduction, he was telling people the reason he wasn't acting that year, in 18, the late 1864, beginning of 1865, is because he had made so much money in oil, he would never need to act again. So that's why John Wilkes is out of the out of the theaters leading up to Lincoln's assassination. He told this to his friends and his family, but June was one of the few who figured out that John Wilkes was lying. He figured out that the well that he had invested in was a total failure and actually wrote a letter to his brother um, telling him he must stop this folly in oil and get back to the business he knew so well of acting. This letter uh, that was written by June to John Wilkes was found in Wilkes' hotel room after the assassination. And once the authorities figured out that he had been using oil as this cover for this plot against Lincoln, they believed that Junius was aware of this and uh, knew about his brother's plot, which he never did. And so he was arrested and put in prison. Uh, Junius would actually spend the most amount of time out of all the group friends and relatives in prison. Uh, he would not be released until June 22nd after spending eight weeks in jail. Um, Edwin Booth is not arrested in the aftermath of his brother's crime, but he actually is brought to Washington and he attends the trial one day, and they were toying with the idea of calling him to testify about his younger brother's uh, matters of persuasion and why all these conspirators may have followed John Wilkes Booth, but it, in the end he, does, he is not called to testify. Um, Asia's husband, uh, John Sleeper Clark, is also imprisoned. Um, it, but he gets released before June does. And uh, Joseph Booth, who has the, he's, he is, before John Wilkes Booth did this, Joseph Booth was the black sheep of the family. It's hard to believe, but Joseph never really knew what he wanted to do with himself. He at first thought he'd be a doctor. He was actually at Fort Sumter when the first shots were fired of the Civil War. He was in medical school down there, and then he got out of there. Um, and then he was just wandering around. He would leave for months on end and no one would know where he was. The brothers were worried he was suicidal. And he had gone off to California by himself. And he picked April 13th, 1865 to leave California and come back east. And this was seen as suspicious by the government. And so when he finally got and landed in New York, he was in prison as well, but eventually released. But June will spend eight weeks in prison.
Uh, like Edwin, June retired from the stage in the aftermath of his brother's crime, but he did eventually return. But when he did return, it was largely in smaller roles, and he, he no longer sought the spotlight. Uh, he kind of felt that maybe the name Booth doesn't need to be plastered everywhere anymore. And so this is when he becomes kind of a theater manager, almost full time. He will still make appearances here and there, but pretty much his life after 1865 is one as a theater manager. Uh, in 1867, uh, June marries again. Uh, and his wife is Agnes Land, who had married Mr. Perry, who was the big name on that playbill. So it was actually her, and she'd been married before, so it was actually her third marriage as well. Um, and she was 22 years younger than June. So he kind of ran the gamut of, oh, a little bit older, younger, way younger. Um, and so this is Agnes, went by Agnes Booth. June and Agnes would have four children together, two of whom would die in childhood. The two purchased a property in Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts. And there, the pair constructed a beautiful cottage on the land. And this is an image of the cottage. Um, nice cottage, I know, I said cottage. You know. This is actually, this is June. So he's standing there on, on his balcony um, at this beautiful cottage. And you can see there's a lot of people there. Um, the Booths found that they loved to entertain and often had um, at people in the theatrical profession coming to visit them. And so um, they decided to expand their house into a full hotel to accommodate their guests. And so they did. And they called their house the Masconoma House. It got a little bigger. This is the cottage that you saw. And they just added on a bit. <laughs> so they opened their own hotel. And so um, Junius kind of moved from theater manager to hotel keeper. But the house was well known to be um, during the summer months, they would have Shakespeare in the park, and they would actually do performances with well-renowned actors who would come there just for vacation. And it was well-known not just to the acting community, but important people of society stayed here, including President Grover Cleveland during his presidency. And the president actually stayed in the Masconoma House. Uh, so it was, it was very well-known. Uh, it opened in 1878, and it was a common summer vacation spot. Um, Junius Bruce Booth Jr. died in Manchester by the sea uh, on September 16, uh, 1883. And this is his grave. Um, it's like an open book, and it's kind of hard to see now, but it does say Junius Bruce Booth. At his side when he died was his wife Agnes and his younger brother Joseph, um, and Edwin Booth and his uh, Edwin Booth joined these uh, other members of the family when the funeral took place in Manchester by the Sea. Mary Ann Booth, his mother was actually still alive. June actually proceeds as much. She lived, I don't remember, but she lived at the ripe old age. So she actually is still alive when June dies, but uh, she is too old and infirm to make it to Massachusetts to attend his funeral. Uh, June is interred uh, next to his two sons by Agnes uh, in Manchester's Rosedale Cemetery. In the years that followed, Agnes would uh, continue running the Masconoma House and remarry. I'm sorry, that was her third marriage. She would remarry, but when she died, she is buried next to him. Uh, Junius Brutus Booth, Jr. Once again, and I will put this picture up. This is the senior. This is Junior. So you can really see how much he looked like his father. In fact, I will pass around one more. <coughs> this is a, a cabinet card image of Junior, but once again, you can see the similarities. And this is why Marianne thought that this was the handsomest of all her children because he so re you know, resembled uh, his father. So Junius Brutus Brutus Jr. never achieved the fame or the infamy of his brothers. Uh, his career on the stage was unremarkable and lacked the spark of genius that led his father and brother Edwin to great success. And yet, as a member of the Booth family, and as someone who was surrounded by um, all their successes and their tragedies, he is an important member uh, in American history. Thank you. I have a few pictures that I wanted to include, but I couldn't figure out where to put them in the speech that I'm just going to go through real quick because I think they're interesting. Uh, this is another picture of Junius Jr. in his very late years, shortly before his death, and you can see once again he looks just like his father. Um, this is my flow chart of keeping track of his marriages and children. So there was Clementina, the first wife. Blanche may or may not be his biological daughter. Asia would write that she was not. 
Um, and that's why we're not quite sure. June would always kind of believe that he was, but then after he divorced Clementina, he kind of left Blanche out of things, and we really don't have a set answer about it. Whether June is Blanche's father. Marion, who went by many nicknames, of course was his uh, daughter from Harry Mace, and then with Agnes, whose actual first name was Marion, they had four children, two of whom died uh, young, and then you may have noticed that something not very happy happened with his namesake. I'll talk to you real quick. Uh, these are some of the children. This is Blanche. Um, I don't think Blanche was actually a Ruth. Um, I, I think that she was kind of an adopted uh, stepdaughter. Um, years later, Blanche would be real low on funds. Uh, she became an actress as well, uh, but she, in her later years, uh, it was hard, especially being an actress. Once you got too old, you didn't get the roles anymore. And so in her later years, Blanche would sell her soul uh, because uh, many of you have heard that there is the story out there that John Wilkes Booth was not killed uh, on April 26, 1865. It was a different man and that the government covered it up. And there's a gentleman by the name of Finest Bates, he was a lawyer who wrote a book called The Escape and Suicide of John Wilkes Booth, in which he tells the whole story about Booth really escaped, only to take his own life in Enid, Oklahoma in the 19, early 1900s. Blanche would sell her soul to Bates, because Bates was looking for anyone to support him in this, and especially if you could find a Booth relative. There was no confusion or any belief by any of the real Booths that it was John Wilkes who was killed, but Blanche in her older years, desperate for money, there's a letter in Georgetown in which she says to find a space, if you will give me $10,000, I'll say whatever you want. And Blanche would sell her, she would claim that it was an open secret in the family that John Wilkes wasn't actually killed. But honestly, I think she was just so desperate for money, she just said whatever find a space want. But every once in a while when you read about it, you'll be like, his own niece said that he wasn't killed. There's a backstory to that that you need to know before you really believe it. So uh, this is Blanche. She later went by, she went by the Booth name, because that was where the money was, um, but she probably was not truly Junius's child. This is Marion again, um, and another picture, so she also became an actress. Uh, this is uh, the son, Sidney Booth, he became an actor as well, he was kind of in the family. Um, he was fairly successful, he is buried right next to his father in Manchester by the sea. And then, the namesake, this is Junius Brutus Booth III, a poor, troubled man. He was an actor, um, wasn't very successful, and he decided at one point to move to England where he decided to open uh, a cinema, so a movie theater. So he went from one theater to another. He and his wife were in, uh, I forget where they moved to, in, uh, in England, and one day he snapped, and he murdered her and killed himself. Uh, and he is buried unmarked in, in England. And so that's the, the last of... Junius Brutus Booths uh, was, was the last one. And then this is the Mascamona house today. The cottage still stands. Um, so my fiance and I went there a couple years ago. So the extra part has been taken down. It's not a hotel anymore, it's a private home. But you can still see the remnants of the original Booth cottage. Um, and so it still stands today. And the Manchester by the Sea Historical Society has a lot of information about the hotel and its, and its life lifespan. And then this is one last image of Junius Booths. Um, plot. So he is buried here. Um, these are the grave. These are the graves of the two children by Agnes who died in childhood. This is Agnes's grave, I and mean, she has Agnes, uh, married Agnes Schofield, which was her married name after Junius died. And then this is Sydney Barton Booth, who I showed you a picture of. And then this is Sydney's wife. Um, so that now kind of marks the rest of my pictures. If there's any questions.